That was, I have a small uh, CPA firm here in San Antonio that we deal primarily with small business as our, as our focus. Therefore, that's why we do a lot of these presentations and workshops is our, our entire goal is to help small businesses be successful. Uh, been in business for close to pushing 25 years, I guess, it kind of give you an idea how old I am. I'm at least 25, in case y'all were questioning. Uh, but we're um, kind of a virtual firm at the moment. We have a, a, an office off of Callahan and 410, and we do a lot of, we, we were doing a lot of workshops and things there in person uh, before the COVID stuff hit. And we've, we're kind of like the Launch SA people. We've kind of disbanded. Uh, we get back together when we can, but it's kind of like to let allow things to calm down a little bit so everybody's more comfortable and coming out. So in the meantime, we're doing all these uh, all over on the Zoom and stuff. Uh, we have a website. It's www.plemonscpa.com. Go look over there. We got all kinds of educational things going over there. Like I said, we're, our, our goal is to work with small business. Uh, we've got a whole series of podcasts that you can get through to YouTube, through Apple, through some of the other YouTube channels, and we're constantly growing and expanding those. Um, and then you also have a workshop schedule of things we have on the, on the calendar for, for workshops in the future. If you see one, jump on there, and we'd love to have everybody that's possible show up for these things. So. Uh, she made the mistake of turning me on, so I guess I uh, won't shut up for till we get done. If you guys have questions, I don't I don't know exactly how large the, the crowd that we have out there is, but generally it's uh, there's a feature that's hold your hand up. We can you can hold your hand up, ask questions now or as we get to some, or just wait till the end. Write down your thoughts uh, and wait till the end, and then we'll I'll hang around till we answer all the questions at the end also. So. I think we're ready to get started. So what we're going to talk about today is analyzing your financial statements. What are they? How, you know, what does this even mean? You're showing me numbers. I don't know what these numbers mean. So we're going to try to go through that. We're going to help you with where do the numbers come from, talk about systems and different, all kinds of different things. So again, hopefully this will be beneficial for you. First thing you got to do is throw always throw in a couple of definitions of because what you are doing as a business owner or as the bookkeeper or whatever that's involved in the finances is you've got to do what's called something called financial management. You know, if you're in the in the pest control business, you've got somebody that's got to manage all of the technicians, get them to the right place at the right time manage the calendar somebody's got to manage the uh the finance part so what is the financial management it's just the management of the money who watches the money who keeps up with the money to help set track and accomplish the objectives of the organization and then we broke it down into four things by planning organizing monitoring uh and directing and we'll, we're going to go through those kind of help define what those mean a little bit planning if you are if you wake up one day and say, I'm going to start a company, there's a little bit of planning that's kind of involved in that. One of them is how in the world am I going to keep up with my books? Not a, not a whole lot of people like bookkeeping. I personally don't like bookkeeping. I like tax stuff and things like that interest me. But somebody's you know got to do the books and somebody's got to plan for it. So you've got to develop a process and your business, you've got to develop it or at least work with somebody to get it developed. Uh, what are you going to use? You need an accounting software. We, we deal with a lot of, like I said, startups. And if you're brand new and you only have three transactions in a year, then yes, uh, an Excel spreadsheet or something like that is, is fine. It's no big deal. But once you start getting, you know, five, 10 transactions a month or more, which most of us are, you're going to need an accounting system. There's QuickBooks, there's Peachtree, there's 
these internet ones called Wave, and honestly, I don't even know the names of all of them. They, I can't keep up with them, but pick one. Pick one that suits your business and stick with it. I would recommend one that's on the internet. We have we used to be uh, QuickBooks desktop junkies, and we said, don't do anything online because the online stuff was not as good. Well, that's, that's all changed now. The online stuff is, is really good for the price that you do have to pay. It's not free, obviously, for QuickBooks and Peachtree and some of those. Uh, but but they're worth your, the money. So then once you know what software you're going to use or your methodology, you got to get into the who, what, when, where, how, why. Who's going to do this? How's it going to get done? What are they going to do? When are they going to do it? Why are they going to do it? On and on. You've got to kind of define all that. And if you're anywhere like me, you know that's really, really hard. Because if, if you give me a box with instructions, like one of these things from Ikea or something. I don't want to look at the instructions. I want to get in there and start putting pieces together. Well, if you guys approach it that way, you know that about a third of the way in, you realize that most of the pieces you put in don't fit uh, and you have to back all the way back out and go back and read the directions. So uh, my advice is just read the directions first, develop your process, develop your methodology before you get to moving too fast. Uh, then you got to organize stuff. All right, so, okay, we said we're going to use QuickBooks Online, and we'll just use that uh, for an example of the day. I'm going to use QuickBooks Online. We're going to do the books, uh, you know, once a week. We're going to have somebody come in, and we're going to pay the bills, and da da, da and you got you got your methodology worked out. Now you've got to organize your documents. How are you going to file things? Are you going to scan all your documents? Are you going to keep paper files? What are you going to do? How are you going to organize it in the, in the actual uh, QuickBooks or accounting system? And we, we always talk about something called a chart of accounts, which you, you can't even begin to use a system without a chart of accounts. So if you think a chart of accounts, this is uh, office supplies, this is your bank account, this is your meals and entertainment, this is your you know, travel expense. These are the categories that you're gonna use in the business to track your assets, liabilities, your expenses. We'll define all those here in a little bit. But this chart of account has to be set up right. So if you've got meals and entertainment, that is an expense, it's not an asset, not a liability, not an equity, not an income. You got to get it in the right category. So, you know, that's an expense. Uh, you, if you're dealing with inventory, that's an asset. It's not an expense. So if you don't get it right in the chart of accounts, if you don't load the system right, you guys have heard garbage in, garbage out, right? If you don't load up the system right, get your chart of accounts right, everything you do from that point after that is going to be incorrect because the chart of accounts dictates to the system, this item goes here, this item goes here, this item goes there. So if you're, if you're not sure, I would suggest getting a little bit of help with the chart of accounts, get yourself set up right. And then you could probably, if you're inclined, take it over and, and do it yourself, but just use somebody to kind of help you get a good, a good start. Uh, <clears throat> Again, this is a little more on the chart of accounts, but the types, you got to have the right type of account, like we said. There's multiple types. There's assets, what you own, liabilities are what you owe, equity is what you got left over, kind of like equity in your house, same theory. Again, we'll talk about these in a second. Income or expense, you got to get your uh, category set up correctly because if you said something as an asset, it's going to show up on the balance sheet when you do reporting. If you set up it up as an expense, it's going to show up on the profit and loss when you do reporting. Uh, so you got your balance sheet, which is assets, liabilities, and equity. Profit and loss, which is income and expense. And then your cash flow, which is a combination of both of them. Therefore, cash flow statements sometimes are confusing. Uh, some people hate them. Some people love them. But I guarantee you, your small business 
And if you've been in business more than a day or two, you understand that cash flow is the heart and soul. If you have no cash flow coming in, I guarantee you, you've got cash flow going out. So the whole cash flow is the heart and soul. That's what you got to manage. Uh, so even if you don't like the cash flow statement, you kind of need to understand it. Here's an example of a chart of accounts. And it's kind of small. Hopefully you can, you can read it. But if you start on, on the left-hand side over there, you see it says checking account, savings account, accounts receivable, fixed assets, et cetera. Then you got an account type, which defines it. That defines what statement that it goes to, which financial statement. Uh, and then you can see the third column is the definition. So an asset goes to the balance sheet, a liability goes to the balance sheet, et cetera, et cetera. So this chart of accounts is just one big long listing um, of your accounts. You can change things in there, but generally if you get them set up right, you don't need to change them. Um, you want to keep them pretty static. What you can do is you can add new ones. I would suggest up front, don't make too many of these. If you get in a QuickBooks or something and it's going to take you through a questionnaire, what do you do? How do you do it? When do you do it? Then it's going to suggest a chart of accounts for you. My experience is it's going to suggest one that's four times the size of what you really need. So maybe you, you take their suggested ones and then you get rid of everything you don't need. Because uh, when you're first starting off, if you're, you, know, you have 20, 25 accounts, that's going to be plenty. You can always add more later as you need them. It's easier to do that than to have way too many to start with. Because uh, then you have consistency problems. You forget where you put it. I've got three mills entertainment. Which one does this go in? Uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, all right, let's take a look at a balance sheet. Now, that, like I said, we're going to look at a balance sheet, profit and loss, and a cash flow statement. And each one has its own unique characteristics. Each one, all I can say, is different. So, a, a balance sheet is your assets. On that chart of accounts, it's your assets, your liabilities, and your equity accounts show on the balance sheet. And what it's going to show you is the balances as a point in time. So if you look at this particular balance sheet right here, computer store balance sheet at January the 31st. This is not the balances at January 30th. It's not the balances at February the 1st. It's as of January 31st. February 1st, the numbers could all change. So if you keep in mind when you're looking at a balance sheet, that's what it is today, or that's what it is when this report was run. So you can see the different categories. We have assets, like I said, and we even further break those down into current assets and uh, called other assets or long-term assets. An asset is something you own. So just go around your business. I own this. I own this machine. I own this computer. I own, um, you know, whatever it is. The current assets versus the long-term assets is a distinction that how long is it going to take for this asset to turn into cash? So, if it's 12 months or less, it's the current asset. So you look at your current assets, inside of that is cash, which is already cash. Accounts receivable, you sure hope it turns within cash within a year. Your inventory, you hope it turns into cash within a year. And then the deposits may be like uh, whatever that 900 represents, you're gonna hope that that's yours, that you're gonna get, it, get to keep it. So assets are what you own. Liabilities are what you owe. This is your debt. This is your telephone bill. This is your credit card bill. This is your uh, what you owe in taxes. This is what what whatever. It's what you what you owe. You have the same category there. You have short term or current liabilities, and these are liabilities that need to be paid within the next twelve months. So, in this case. Accounts payable zero, but typically if you have accounts payable, your terms with that vendor are going to be zero to 30 days, somewhere in there. 
Uh, so accounts payable is always going to be current liability. Um, taxes due are generally due within 12 months. If not, somebody's coming after you if you don't pay them anyway. Uh, and then you, let's say you borrow money from a bank. Uh, that bank loans you $100,000. You're going to have to break that loan payment out into the loan payments that are due in the next 12 months are current liabilities. The loan payments that are due after the next 12 months are long-term debt. So you got to make that distinction. Uh, make sure your bookkeeper has what we call an amortization schedule, which can show you month by month how much the payment is, how much is interest, how much is principal, et cetera. And, and if you ever go to borrow money, the bankers are going to look at, they look at your current assets, your current liabilities. Are you making enough money uh, to pay this debt? You know, one of the, you know, go figure, bankers don't like to loan you money if they don't think you can pay them back. And I don't understand where they came up with that concept. But generally, they want to say, are you generating the money to pay me back? If, you, if they don't think you can pay them back, they're not going to loan you the money because they'll get fired from the bank. So you got to, they're going to use these. We're going to talk more about these later when we have ratios and different things like that. Jump back to the asset side. You've got long-term assets, fixed assets, um, different things like that. What a fixed asset is, again, remember an asset is something you own. A fixed asset is something that has a life greater than, than a year, okay? So think of computers, think of cars, think of machinery and equipment, office supplies, telephone, I mean, office supplies, no. Your cell phone bill, no. Those don't have a life of greater than a year. So if you go buy a computer and you pay $1,000 for a computer, generally that says it's a fixed asset. A computer has a life of greater in one year, you put it on the balance sheet as a fixed asset, and then you expense that off over a period of years. So the IRS has very specific things that says computers go into this category, you expense them off over so many years. So if you look at the balance sheet, you have fixed assets of a thousand, and it says less depreciation. Another term for that is accumulated depreciation. What that shows you is the amount of depreciation or the amount of that thousand dollars that you have expensed off over the life of that. So the fact that it's zero says we just bought that, we haven't taken any depreciation. If the, uh, the, the less depreciation line was a thousand dollars, that says we've totally written off this uh, this asset, we've expensed it through de a depreciation expense thing. I know it's a little confusing, uh, but that's why you have accountants to ask some of those questions. That's why you have your, your bookkeepers. Please use your bookkeepers, ask them lots of questions. Um, hopefully they'll be able to answer your, answer, uh, answer your questions. If not, you know, give us a call or come back to some more of these uh, webinar things. We can talk about them. Okay, that's a balance sheet. Balance sheets is a point in time. Keep that in mind. Tomorrow, it may look different. Yesterday, it looked different, but we're looking at it as of today. Uh, now we got an income statement, or, and you'll have to forgive me because we use a lot of terms interchangeably. P&L, uh, income statement, we kind of use those terms interchangeably. There's no difference in what we mean is just, you know, like you call your kids, you got three kids and you call them all by the wrong names, but that's okay. You know, you're talking to your kids, your kids know you're talking to them. It's kind of the same thing. But a profit and loss or an income statement is not a point in time. The balance sheet was a point in time. A profit and loss or income statement has a starting date, and an ending date. It can be for a month. This is for the month of January. It could be for a quarter. This is for the first quarter of 2021 or 2022. It could be for a year. This is for the year 2021. So 
in the, in the, when you're looking at a profit and loss, you want to make sure you understand what what time parameters are we looking at here. So if you look at this particular one, it's only for the month of January. So whatever happened in December doesn't show up here. It's irrelevant. Whatever show happens in February doesn't show up here. It's real. It's it's irrelevant. So keeping that in mind. And then from your chart of accounts, you remember we set up income and expense accounts. That's what's gonna to flow to here. So you have your sales, uh, your cost of goods sold. We'll tell you what that is in just a second. And then just your normal expenses. This is your rent, your payroll, all the normal type expenses, telephone, office expense, bank charges, et cetera, et cetera. You can see the type of stuff that's up there. Um, so your sales is number one. How much income, for, since this is the month of January, how much were my sales in January? In this case, $8,000 total, $7,500 for taxable sales, $500 for services. And we put, a, put that up there. The taxable is referring to sales tax. You don't have to use these names. You can use any names you want to. Uh, but for this example, the taxable sales is referring to sales tax. So we had $7,500 of sales of items that we're gonna to have to pay sales tax to the state on. We had $500 of income from services, which we don't have to pay the state sales tax on. So we got 8,000 total sales. The section that's cost of goods sold, if you're in a service business like I am, we. We don't manufacture, we don't create a tangible product that we sell to somebody. We sell our time, we sell our knowledge, our, our services. Uh, I like to use the example of lawnmowers. If you're in the business of selling lawnmowers, you're gonna have a cost of goods sold section. If you're in the service business like I am, you don't even gonna, you're not gonna have it. So just ignore, uh, ignore that section. What the cost of goods sold is, is the cost of the product that you're selling. So let's go back to the lawnmower example. I sell lawnmowers and uh, so I have to buy material. I buy the wheels, I buy the engines, I buy the cabling, that I buy the pieces of the lawnmower. Okay, I have labor that puts the lawnmowers together. So you've got, it, when you're doing a cost of goods sold thing, you kind of segregate cost of goods sold labor, which is primarily your shop labor, the people out in the shop putting your parts together, that kind of stuff versus the office staff. Office staff is normal overhead. Uh, warehouse staff, whatever is generally gonna be in the cost of goods sold if you're using that. You can see the total cost of goods sold is 4,000. So we sold, uh, However many lawnmowers, let's say the taxable sales were all lawnmowers. We sold $7,500 worth of lawnmowers. Those lawnmowers cost us $4,000 to sell, to build, to create, and buy the parts, put them together. So we have what's called a gross profit. Gross profit is what your sales were, less your cost of goods sold. It's called gross profit. It's also called gross margin. Uh, if you're in the retail business, the manufacturing business, that's a very, very important number to you. You want to make sure that your margin is high enough to support all your other expenses that you have. Uh, you go into retail stores like the, the Dillard's and, the, and those type clothing stores. They will buy clothes, double them, triple them, put them on the floor at triple, let's say, what they paid for them. So, you know, they're expecting a gross profit of so much, what is that, 66%, something along those lines. Uh, then when they start marking it down, obviously their margin goes down, but to them margin is extremely important. If, like I said, if you're not in the business of selling a per, an actual product, you probably don't care. Other expenses below that are just everyday expenses, advertising, accounting, contract labor. The, the depreciation line is what we're writing off of the fixed assets. You remember carryover from the balance sheet. Uh, this is where we expense those pieces. 
But you can see these are just accounts, very generic accounts that most companies have. You're gonna have rent, telephone, payroll, payroll taxes, et cetera, et cetera. The big deal on a PL is remember it's point A to point B. It's not a point in time, a start and a finish. The next one, which is, is confusing, this is, uh, I'll try not to confuse you too much, but this is a cash flow statement. Cash flow statement, there's different ways you can do a cash flow statement, but if you're just starting out, the easiest way to do a cash flow statement is look in your checkbook, honestly, and not get this sophisticated, but say is my cash balance is going up or my cash balance is going down. Then you can go from there to figure out why is it going up, why is it going down? But, but the more in, uh, sophisticated you get, the more in, transactions you get, you're gonna end up with something like this. But a cash flow is like a p &L. It's got a beginning and an ending. Not, it's not a point in time. So this case, we're looking at January. And it's, it's only going to be things that happen in January. We don't care February. We don't care December. They don't affect this, the January only. So if you look up there, we're going to start. There's different formats. Like I said, this is just one that's a little more simple than some of the more complicated ones, obviously. But you start with cash on hand. We, we have $5,000 the day that we started January. January 1st, we had $5,000. We sold $6,000 worth of products that we got paid for. If you sell them on account, but you haven't got paid for them, that's not cash flow. It's not cash flow till you get paid. So you can see cash sales of 6,000 um, collected a loan and or sales tax, most likely that sales tax. So we had 6,000 in sales, plus we collected $495 of sales tax from customers that we have to turn around and send uh, to the state. So we brought in a total of 6,495 plus our 5,000. Says we had before spending money, $11,495 to spend. Uh, so we bought inventory, we paid wages. And you see just right down the line, those are expenses that are paid. Um, if you don't pay them, if you didn't pay it till February the 1st, it doesn't show up on here, okay? Keep in mind, this is paid only. If you're using a QuickBooks or a Peachtree or one of those, they're gonna do all this for you. They're gonna pick out only the ones that have been paid. This is, I'm kind of giving you this in case you wanna do it by hand and I don't know anybody that wants to do them by hand. But you, subtotal of all the expenses are 6,550. They made a payment back on a loan of 150 bucks. So a loan is a balance sheet, expenses are income, uh, sales taxes, balance sheet. So you see here's where you're mixing and matching balance sheet and income statement stuff. But a loan principal payback, and the reason you put it on here is because it affects your cash. Cash in, cash out. That's your cash flow. So the total cash out was 6,700. Ending cash, 4795 So what does that tell you? We had a negative cash flow for the month of January because we only brought in total cash receipts of 6495 We sent out 6700 Therefore, we had a negative cash flow for the, for the month of January. Okay, moving on. I know y'all got that one. No problem, right? Uh, you need to monitor. So you can't just look at a cash flow and go, okay, I'm fine. Or look at a balance sheet and go, okay, I'm fine. It doesn't work that way. This is your money, your business, your money. I highly suggest you keep track of your money and you keep up with where David, it's going. David, yes. sorry, we do have a question. I don't know if it was addressed. Is there a reason you need you needed expense off fixed assets? You, yeah, you must, you must depreciate fixed assets. Um, and again, not to get too crazy, but there's certain things the IRS will not allow you to expense, but the vast majority of things, you, you expense them off because they deteriorate. A computer, 
will within a five year time period be worthless. So what you're trying to do is match the deterioration of the asset uh, with depreciation. You don't depreciate land um, because it doesn't depreciate in value. So, um, so yeah, generally you're, you're going to do that, but there are certain assets that you don't. Hopefully that helped answer your question. Um, ways to monitor your financial data. The, the easiest thing that I've seen that I like is called a trend analysis. So you notice that the PL was the month of January. If you wanted to analyze 2021, you take January 2021 PL, but right beside it, you put February, right beside it, you put March, and you put the entire 12 months out there. Then you take your finger and you say, okay, okay, here's the income line, and you just run it across all 12 months. Is every month somewhat consistent? And you go, oh, no. In July and August, things dropped. The bottom fell out, but it came back in September. That tells you you need to figure out what happened. It's either a cyclical thing that's going to happen every year or something weird happened. You need to know why that happened. If all the numbers are, are pretty consistent, then, then you may be okay. Uh, that debt may have been an accounting error. Somebody may have put something in wrong. Your building could have struck by lightning. Whatever it was, just as long as you know the answer and you know how to deal with it. Uh, budget versus actual. People hate doing budgets. I hate doing budgets as bad as any of you do. But... If you don't do a budget, how do you know if you're achieving your goals? Your budget should reflect your goals. We want sales to be up 20%. We want profit to be up 20%, whatever. If without a budget line by line, you're not going to be able to get there and you have nothing to compare to. So budget versus actual is important. Review your, your business plan. That's going to shock people. Um, most people that write a business plan stick it in a drawer and never look at it again. I would highly suggest that's not a good idea. Uh, and again, we'll talk a little bit about that and then, uh, then some ratios here too. Okay, trend analysis. Just like we said, review all the months of the year in one report. Anything looks goofy, figure out what it is. It doesn't mean it's wrong. It doesn't mean it's bad. Just understand it. Some businesses are very, very cyclical. My business is very, is pretty, very cyclical because over the 25 years, I can tell you when my cash flow is going to stop, when it's going to start. So, for example, uh, we do a lot of tax returns. So you can see a lot of revenue February, March, up to April the 15th. April the 16th, you couldn't beat a nickel out of anybody because nobody's going to pay us for a couple of months until they all get back in the mindset. Okay, we got to do taxes again. So tax deadlines, we know exactly when they are. We know the cash flow is going to shut off. We need to make sure we have enough money in the bank to carry us until, the, until it picks back up. Those dips are normal. We understand them. You plan for them. Uh, learn the ebb and flows, what we were just talking about. Does it compare to what you had in your business plan? Is your trend consistent with prior years? Uh, you know, you, have been, you may have been doing trend analysis on 2017, 2018, 2019. And when you get to 2020, it doesn't match. Well, you know, all right, first thing you'd think was, okay, well, this whole COVID disruption issue hit your business. I know a lot of businesses that COVID didn't affect them at all. In fact, it, it affected them on a positive manner. Trucking companies, medical labs, all kinds of things. They just, they exploded with business while others, their business dried up. So again, I understand it. Uh, and then the trend analysis also helps you plan for the future because you know in my opinion, our world has changed. I don't know if we'll ever go back to doing business the way we did three or four years ago. We have changed. We're, we're doing things differently. And I think the world is going to uh, continue that direction. Okay, so here's the budget versus actual. So we have a profit loss. 
This is for an entire year. Remember we said start point, end point. So you got January through December of 2017 uh, versus the budget, okay? And again, just look up there, look at the variance column. Uh, income is 160,000 greater than the budget. So what does that tell you? It tells you you're gonna have more expenses probably. Uh, if, if my revenue's up that and I sell a product, well, then I had to have bought the product that I'm selling. Or if I'm selling labor, I had to have hired some labor to be able to get my sales up. So I automatically looking at that top line, I'm gonna expect my expenses to have gone up also for the things that directly support revenue. And if you look down through here, advertising was, uh, was over budget. Okay, the expense was 5,000 more than the budget, but I wouldn't get upset about that because it helped create the $160,000 uh, of income. So you would expect those type things to be bigger. Um, but the biggest one is payroll. Like I said, sales are up. What do we sell? We sell our time, we sell our labor, we sell our expertise. Then if sales are up, Either you've just worked everybody to a pulp or you've hired new people and your payroll uh, should be up. Incomes up, guess what? Taxes are gonna be up. So on that profit and loss, nothing surprises me or nothing upsets me, even though we're over budget $92,000 in payroll, that's okay because I know um, that it that it brought us 160,000 more in sales and basically another 46,000 in in profit. So when you look at these, put everything into perspective. This is a budget, and there's multiple kinds of budgets you can do. Um, my preference is to do a budget at the first of the year that never changes. Here's at the first of the year. Here's what we think is going to happen. Here's our budget. As real life occurs, maybe every quarter, you go back and adjust that, but you don't, you don't change your original budget. You come up in something I call a forecast. Okay, based on the first quarter, here's what we think the rest of the year is going to look like. Maybe you do that at the end of each quarter, keeping that original budget because you still want to compare. All right, at this point in time, we thought this was going to happen. It didn't happen. Why? A lot of why questions you need to be asking uh, when you're going through your financials. Here's why I think the business plan is important. Let's say we developed a business plan. We were in the state of Washington and the business plan says, we're gonna go to Denver. We're gonna dig a gold mine and we're gonna strike it rich, okay? So we start the business and we're doing our thing and they, you know, stuff happens, life happens. We get, this happens, this happens, we move over here, we do this, la di da da And then five years later, we look up and go, uh-oh, we're in Arizona. We thought we were going to Denver to go to create a gold mine. How in the world did we end up in Arizona? What happened? That may be good, it may be bad, but if you had, pull that business plan out periodically. And I suggest at a minimum once a year, pull it out and review it. And you got certain assumptions. You know, we're, we're gonna do this, we're gonna go here. This is our strategy. This is our customers. This is our, our competition. If you don't ever look at that, you're gonna end up in Arizona. If you do look at it, you're more inclined to end up in Colorado or purposely end up in Arizona. You may pull that business plan out and say, whoa, that's terrible. We were so dumb. We didn't know what we were doing. We really need to be in Arizona. Okay, there's nothing wrong with being in Arizona, but just make sure that's where you need to be according to your business plan. And if that's the case, I would suggest you rewrite your business plan or update it to reflect the fact that uh, uh, we're more interested in silver mines in Arizona than gold mines in, in Denver. Uh, this, is my, this is the part I like. This is easy, very, very easy ways to analyze financials. If you have 
a bookkeeper, give them a list of ratios you're interested in, have them run them for you. This will reduce the amount of time that you're uh, spending to analyze the financial statement. And there are literally hundreds of ratios. I just picked a handful, like five of them here to show as an example. So don't think these are all that there is out there. But there's ones based on what are your li liquidity, uh, on your activity, on your prop prop profitability, uh, and how much you know do you have around sitting to pay on debt? Obviously, the bankers are interested in the liquidity and the coverage ratio, profitability. They like them all, uh, again, because like I said, they, they want to get paid back. Current ratio is very, very simple. It goes back to the balance sheet current assets divided by the current liabilities. And if you recall, current assets are things we expect to turn into cash within a year or they're, or they're already cash. Current liabilities, things we have to pay within a year. So you divide these two current assets, let's say it's 100, current liabilities, let's say it's 50. So the answer is two, your cur current ratio is two. It means you can pay your current debt twice with the current assets you have. Bankers like that, they like positive numbers. They like to know that you can pay uh, your debt. But, you know, you may look at two and go, that's great, I can, you know, I'm do that, I'm, I'm real happy. What we always suggest is look at your competition. If you are in the, let's, let's make you a roofer. You're in a roofing business, lots of roofing companies in town. And every one of them has a current ratio of eight. Your current ratio is two, and you don't know that everybody else has got eight. You're sitting here fat, dumb, and happy with a two and not realizing you should be at eight. So you got a lot of work to do to get to eight. So not only do you need to look at your own company, you need to look at your competition. And there are ways to get ratios. Uh, if you go to the downtown library up on the top floor, there's a business center that has tons and tons of business research stuff. You can go up there and find out by, you know, ratios and all kinds of stuff by um, NAICS codes and, and things like that. So I would suggest you do a little bit of, a little bit of homework. Liquidity ratios, the banker will do those, I guarantee you. If you're going in to borrow money and if it's not a good ratio, uh, things may not go well. You may get a cup of coffee and a kick in behind on the way out the door. Um, activity ratios, let's think about your accounts receivable. If, if you're in a business where you give people 30 days to pay you, you wanna make sure you get your money within 30 days. So this ratio, it takes your net sales, divided by your average trade receivable. So let's say we're doing this for this ratio for a year. My average receivables or my receivables at January 1st, my receivables at December 31st divided by two. That's my average receivables. If your sales over your average receivables are 12, that means you're getting paid monthly, okay? Once a month, you're getting getting your um, receivables paid. Isn't this a lot easier than going back through and digging this vendor, this vendor, this vendor? Have your bookkeeper, somebody put this up. What do you want it to be? You want it to be, I would suggest not less than 12, but to, you know, maybe, maybe 16, maybe 24. Depends on your, your payment cycle and your industry. But I, if it was less than 12, I might really, uh, have somebody dig around, find out what's going on. You, you may have some problems in your receivables. You may be selling to a vendor, I'm sorry, to a customer that's not paying you, that customer's suffering. Therefore, you're fixing to eat his problem if you don't cut him off or get him on a cash first or, or you know, if you don't work that problem. A similar ratio is, is the same thing on inventory. It takes your cost of goods sold. Remember, we we said if you're in a service business, you don't have a cost of goods sold. And a service business, you're not gonna have this ratio. But if you have inventory and you sell a product, you're gonna take that cost of goods sold divided by your average inventory. And again, if that's 12, that means your inventory is turning over once a month. 
So if you're in a clothing store or retail, um, is once a month good enough to turn that stuff? I don't know. I'm not in the retail business, but I think they like things to turn a little faster. If you're in technology, let's say you, you manufacture computers or chips or something. I mean, the technology in those seems like it changes weekly. So if your inventory turnover is only once a month, are you keeping up with technology? You may be developing bad inventory. So if the number's less than 12 or numbers are less than what you want, that tells you you got inventory problems. Either nobody likes what you have, it's obsolete, it's priced wrong, something's wrong in that, uh, in that cycle. So again, quick and dirty way, if this number hits what you want, you're done, uh, you move on. Profit margin on sales is just net income divided by net sales. So if your net income is 100, your net sales are 1,000, you got a 10% profit margin. And everybody goes, yeah, yeah I, I like 10%. Well, if you're in the grocery business, 10% is humongous. They have a very, very low margin. Uh, Exxon has a very low margin. Microsoft has a very high margin. So again, check your competition. You need to be keeping up with your competition, not somebody who's in a totally uh, different industry. So if you're Microsoft, you're making 50% margin, but Apple and everybody else is making Google or making 80%, you know, you were happy until you found out what everybody else has made. Uh, you can't run a business in a bubble. You've got to get out there. You've got to find out what everybody else is doing and make sure you beat them. It is a competition whether, whether you like it or not. And the last one is just simply total debt divided by total assets. So, you know, we talked about the current ratios, current assets divided by current liabilities. Now we're talking about total debt. And then this is flipping the debt on top divided by total assets uh, to get you uh, some coverage ratios. Again, a banker's probably gonna wanna do this. Even if your current ratio looks good, they'll go, okay, well, that's only for the next 12 months. What's going to look like for the next five years? This is kind of, kind of uh, give some of that. But develop ratios that make sense to you, that make sense to your business, to your industry. I just picked out some that were easy, fairly easy to explain here. Okay, you, then you got to monitor your stuff. You can't just set it up and let it go. So you got to monitor it. Uh, find out where am I spending my money? Am I making enough to hire another employee? Is my business cyclical? Is that good? I don't know, maybe bad. Maybe, maybe everybody else in your industry is not cyclical and you are. Figure it out. Where can I cut costs? Do I have money to spend on advertising? Am I going to owe taxes at the end of the year? Uh, a lot of stuff going on there. We do estimate or recommend that once you get into the where your company's making some money and you're going to owe taxes that you get a tax estimate somewhere during the year. We typically start doing tax, tax estimates in July, August, September in that time frame with our customer or our clients and say, okay, look here, it looks like if you don't do something, you're going to owe $100,000 in taxes. Are you happy with that? And very few people are. So, okay, here's, here's what we need to do to reduce that 100,000, we still got three months left in the year to do it. You can't tax plan after the year's over with. You can't tax plan with only a week or two left in the year. You need to have time to implement some, uh, uh, some of the things. Um, now that you have answers, make a decision, fix a problem, pat yourself on the back and do it all over again because it's a never ending cycle. As long as you own this business, as long as you run this business, this is a never ending cycle for you to keep up with. Uh, if you, Cause again, like I said, it's your money. If you wanna keep up with your money, this is what you need to do. Uh, this is just a, a thing of us. There's our website phone number. If you'd like a copy of the charts, uh, send an email to admin at plemoncpa.com and they'll be happy to send you out a copy of these charts. And then, you know, if you're interested in podcasts and stuff, 
uh, go on there and look at the podcast. We have a lot of our clients will come in and uh, talk about their business. We, we call it the hustle, juggle, and struggle, or HSJ. Clients will come in and talk about, here's what I went through. Here's the issues we had. Here's how we solved it, et cetera. You can learn a lot from those. They're very interesting. We have a unique group of uh, people out there doing the podcast. Uh, so please visit. They're all free. They're all for you guys to go use to learn. Um, and hopefully they'll, they'll help you out. We also have a QuickBooks online, a QuickBooks corner on the website. We're des constantly designing little uh, one or two or th five minute videos. Here's how you do this in QuickBooks. Here's how you do that. Uh, if you have questions on the QuickBooks, go to that QuickBooks corner. Uh, and then we're, we have big plans to make that, that a whole big, uh, a big thing over the next year or two. It's really going to ex expand on that. So anyway, that's what we are. I got done three minutes early, so I will hang around for any questions. Uh, if anybody's still awake just and you got questions, uh, put it out there and we'll do the best we can. Thank you, David, so much. And if anybody has any questions, do you want to unmute yourself, raise your hand, or put it in the chat? I put in on uh, the email and also the website. That way you can, you have it handy to copy and paste on the chat as well. We, we are recording this session and we'll upload it to our YouTube channel in case you want to go back and, and check some of the stuff we saw today. I'm going to stop the recording.